So uh, yesterday we started talking about the Megillah. We're talking about some of the hidden messages, some of the hidden conversations which take place in the Megillah, which for those who weren't, weren't here last night, we said there are many things which are not written explicitly, but many parts of the events of the story which are written in code, which are alluded to, which we need the Midrashim to fill us in for, for various reasons, which I won't go into now, but if you weren't here and you're interested, you can look that up on YouTube. But um, one of the things, one of the interesting conversations which takes place, that we said when Mordechai is sitting outside in the, uh, in, in the entrance to the palace, and Esther sends a messenger to him and says, Mordechai is sitting in his sackcloth, and she says, uh, she sends a message to Mordechai, Ladat, Mazev al Mazev, right? To, in order to find out what is this and what is it about. And Chazal tell us that in those words, Ladat, Mazev al Mazev, there is an allusion to the two Luchot to the, the uh, tablets which Moshe Rabbeinu brought down from Har Sinai, because over there it says, right, that the words written on the Luchot, not written, really engraved in the stone, were engraved all the way through from both sides. Mizeh right? umizeh, started on one side of the stone and went, went all the way through. And Chazal say in the Gemara that, that Esther sent the message to Mordechai to say in the hint in the, in the Megillah from, this, uh, from these words, mazev al mazev is to say, maybe this has come about, Shema Avru Yisrael Chamishachum Shei Torah, maybe they have transgressed the five uh, books of the Torah, which are, which uh, is alluded to, right, from it says, Mizem Mizem Ketuvim, which are engraved on both sides. So we asked the question, why, what, what is, all of this got to do, very nice, the word Mazer, Mizer, okay, but what, what's the connection to what happened in Purim, to the fact that the Luchot were engraved on both sides? And why specifically does she say Chamishachum Shei Torah? Maybe they they transgressed all five Chamishachum Shei Torah. That sounds quite quite severe. So mentioned again yesterday the Gemara that says talks about the Chataim, talks about the sins that were in that generation or just before preceding the Purim story. There was the fact that Neanumi Suratoshel Torah Sha that they went to this uh, they went to the meal they went to the banquet of the Chashverosh. There was the fact that Ishtachabul at Selem that they bowed down to an idol, or pretended to bow down to an idol in those days. And this was the beginning of the Puran. This was the beginning of the, uh, you know, the decree of Haman and, and, and all of the destruction, which took place some years later. But Chazal tell us that, that uh, when one has a broad outlook on this, we understand all these events are connected. So what has this got to do with Mizeo Mizeh? So the Be'er Yosef, we just started, just started to explain this yesterday, now we can elaborate. Be'er Yosef, Rav Yosef Salan, he gives the following explanation. And he says, you know, in those generations, what does it mean, mizeu mizeu? The point is, you know, there were a lot of miracles which took place with this writing on the stone, on the tablet. Right? Mizeu mizeu means that they were engraved all the way through. First of all, engraving is very significant. It's very different to if you write something down on a piece of paper, or you use something with ink. Right? So you write that after time, it disappears, it fades, it, 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 uh, the ink wears away, whatever it is. When you engrave something in stone, and you engrave it all the way through the stone that is far more lost, that is far more permanent. And you engrave it all the way through, you can't now come along and change it. You try, you come along and you try and chip through, the whole thing will just, uh, will just disappear. If, you have, if you've written something, you can change it, you can erase, you can, once it's engraved all the way through the stone, there's no way to erase it. There's no way to change it. It's there, it's there the way it is forever. More than that, the Gemara tells us there was something miraculous that took place with these Luchot. And you look at all the letters, well, the letters which are, which are uh, engraved that are inscribed in the Luchot. So there's no problem. You, you engrave the letter and it goes all the way through. You know, you have the line of the Aleph and you have the line coming out and that, you, you, you chip away where the letter is and you have the stone around it. There are two letters where it's problematic. There are two letters where it doesn't work, right? You have Mem, the Gemara says the final Mem, and the Samach, because both of those are a closed chain. So if you try and chip, you try and engrave through, you're going to have a block in the middle that's just, it's just going to fall away. So it was miraculous, says the Gemara, that those letters were, were, were there, that were engraved in the stone. They were engraved all the way through, but nonetheless, it still, uh, it still, uh, still stood there. Do you have any, some, some maps? And you can, you can have, now you can be looking the rest of the, the show to try and, try and find it. But uh, so, so, so that was something else. 
There was another miracle. We actually spoke about this a few weeks ago, Project Yitro, right? Which is that although it was engraved all the way through from one side of the stone to the other, whichever way you looked at it, you would read it in the right way, right? So you looked at it from this side of the, of, of the Luchot, it would read from right to left. You looked at it on the other side, it would read from right to left. How is that possible? It's not, but it's a miracle. That was, so, so, so those are some of the characteristics that we had on these Luchot, some of the miraculous characteristics. The fact that it was that it was engraved all the way through, mizel mizem ktuvim, it was permanent; it couldn't be changed. The fact that it stood miraculously, even though the letters were were, were chipped away, that it could be read from all sides, front to back, inside and outside, backwards and forwards. Right. So he says, "What is the meaning behind all of this? What's the deeper idea behind this mizel mizem ktuvim?" So says Rav Salant the following. He says, "You know, in those days, maybe how did how did uh, Bnei Israel get to the situation?" How did they get to the situation with such such severe sins uh, to the extent that they were, you know, they had this decree of, 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 uh, of destruction hanging over their heads? So maybe they said to themselves the following. They said, you know, nowadays, now where we are in this empire, under this kingdom, under this government, in this place, we don't need to be so from anymore. Right? We've got, we've got the Torah. We kept the Torah. We kept the Hamishah Chum Shei Torah. They were given in a way in a certain time, in a certain place. <laughs> We are in Eretz Israel, and we've got the Beit Hamikdash. We've got uh, sovereignty. We've got to keep everything. Nowadays, things are a little bit different. Nowadays, there's a foreign king. He says you've got to bow down to an idol. Okay, so maybe we can pretend we should bow down to an idol. We've got a foreign king who's running a who's running a feast for the for 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 all of his nations and all of his subjects. What happens if we don't go? Even though it's a feast that's celebrating uh, our downfall, and even though it's celebrating the fact that there's no more Beit Mikdash, and he's going to bring out the Kalim, and he's going to wear the the, the clothes of the Kohen Gadol, and all of this, but it's going to look bad if the Jews don't the Jews don't show up. So maybe it's not. Maybe it does. It's not so bad. Maybe it's, there are certain things. Maybe there are certain parts of the Torah which, in our current state of exile, in our current geopolitical constellation that exists. These mitzvot don't, don't apply. Most of them we'll still keep. We'll still keep the ones that we can. But certain things we can drop. Certain things have changed. In other words, the Torah, the way it was given, was relevant, was important, was, uh, was uh, authoritative in a certain time and in a certain age. But in a different age and in a different place, certain things are not. We spoke about this a little bit on Shabbat. Right? We spoke about the, the, the idea by the, by the Aaron, where the Aaron had... Had the the abadim lo yasuro mimeno, right? You had the poles which were used to carry the aron. All the other kelim in the in the mishka, when they were addressed, they were addressed. You took the poles and you put them away in the machsa. Right? But by, 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 by the aron, no, no, no. All the time the poles were there. And it's reverse explained, discussed on Shabbat that the, the it's always ready to go. It's always ready to move. It's always authoritative. It's always relevant wherever you are. So he says, says the bear yourself. This is what Esther was hinting at tomorrow. When he says, Ladad mazeva al maze. how did all of this come about? This came about because maybe they forgot, maybe they forgot specifically the message of the fact that these, that these mitzvot, that the, these dibrot were engraved in such a way from one side of the stone all the way to the other. They're engraved in a way that is everlasting, in a way that is permanent, in a way that can, ne that can never be changed, that can never be removed. To show you these mitzvot, these dibrot apply always, wherever. So they shouldn't have gone to the Suda of Hashverosh. They had the rabbi, the gadla door of the time. Mordechai told them not to go. But they did. But it's Mizeu Mizem Ktuvim. That was the message. And that's what they have to remember. We know the way the poem story ends. At the end of it is Kimu Vakiblu. Once again, they accepted upon themselves Torah. And they accepted upon themselves that it was, that it did apply. And it was relevant in every generation. And that's how we get to our, that's how we get to our happy ending. So he says, so a few things from this Mizeu Mizem Ktuvim, the different aspects that we discussed. Number one, the fact that it's permanent, the fact that it goes all the way through, the fact that it applies in every generation. Number two, the fact that it was miraculous, right? You have the Mem and you have the Samach. So he says, says the Ber Yosef, there might be situations where it looks like it's, it's, uh, it's impossible. You say, how can the Torah apply here? How can, how can it still be? Doesn't mean it's easy. Doesn't mean it's always, always, uh, made, always easy to do. But just in the same way there, it's miraculous. Even when it seems like it can't be, it always can be, it always is relevant. And he says, number three, Whatever side you go, wh wh whichever side you come at, whichever way you look at it, you read it this way, you read it that way, from the inside, from the outside. He says, maybe they, they by, by the Ishtachavul Atzelem, we quoted the Gemara yesterday, which says they bowed down to an idol. They didn't really mean it. It was, it was, it was sort of a pretend, right? So he says that it's not, 
don't think either that there's a there's a reality that you can change. You can say, we'll keep the Torah inside, but we'll go outside, we'll do some things, we'll pretend. We're, no, whichever way you look at it, whichever way you see, you've got to keep it, it's got to be real, it's got to, it's got to apply. That is the idea. And, and that is what that is what Esther perhaps was hinting at when she said to Mordechai. There is another idea here, which uh, we mentioned yesterday, some of the things that are not written in the Megillah. One of the things which is not written, which would seem to be obvious, and we, we gave one reason yesterday, why not, is when Haman comes to Achashverosh and he says, Yesh echad mufurad ben right? There is a nation out there and I want to destroy them. He doesn't say who. Right? Now you think about it, the, the, this whole thing is very, very strange. Right? You're the king of this, of this huge empire, 127 provinces across the world. Somebody comes to you, says there's a nation out there some of your subjects who are disloyal, I want to, I want to destroy them. That's the first question you ask. Well, who are they? Right? Which nation? You, you're going to now go and you're going to give him a license to go do whatever he wants to whoever he wants without even knowing who they are? So we suggested yesterday one approach might be, in fact, Achashverosh knew and Achashverosh was part of the plan, but they, when they wrote it down, they didn't want it to be that way. They didn't want to make it obvious. Right? I refer you to, to, to yesterday's show for that. But we'll give it now a slightly different explanation as well. Which is, that's not the only question, because when, after this plan is hatched, so Esther arranges the feast with Achashverosh and with Haman, and when she reveals what has happened, she says to her, this is after Haman has gone to Achashverosh and he set out, he set out his whole plan, and he's got an authority from him, and he's got the king's ring, and he's got the decree, and he's done everything. <laughs> and then Esther comes along and she says, the, your majesty, the king, there is a there, there's an evil plan. Somebody wants to go and wants to destroy me and destroy my entire nation. And Achashverosh is confused and he's furious. He says, how can this be? Who, who, who is this? Who could do it? What's, what, what's going on? And she points to her man and he says, it's a man and, and the whole thing. Three days ago, Three days ago, you, Achashverosh, went to Ham Haman, came to you and said, I have a plan. I want to destroy these people. And you said, sure, go ahead. Do, do, do whatever you want. So first of all, what, what, why is the surprise? Why is the confusion? You know what's going on. Maybe, okay, maybe you didn't know who exactly, but, but you knew all about the plan. You know what was going on. You gave the authority for it. More than that, Haman's reaction. Haman's standing there. This is, uh, this is off with his head in a few moments, right? This is, this is his life. He, now is the time to argue your case. Now is the time to plead, your, to, to plead your case. And the king is furious. He's angry. What's, he's got a, a man seemingly has a very good answer here. He says, everything I've done, I have your authority. Three days ago, you gave me, you gave, you gave me permission to do it. It was all signed and sealed with the king. You, you agreed to it. You acquiesced everything. So what is going on in the story? All of a sudden, Esther comes and says, there is a plan. There is a plot. La rog, la shmid, la abed. Right, to destroy my people. Cheshverosh doesn't know what's going on, even though three days prior to this, he's given authority for it to happen. Haman says nothing, even though he could have gone and said, you, you your majesty, the king, you are the one who, who agreed to this plan. So why not? So the Malvim suggests the following, following explanation. He says, those words, la rog, la shmed, la bed, right? We say them all the time. What is the difference between la rog, la shmed, la bed? Why do we need, why do we need to say all these different words? And he sa says, he says, Haman was a politician. He doesn't say it in those words. Those are my words. But what, 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 he says the following. He says, Haman came to Achashverosh. And remember, he says, he says, there is a nation. There is a nation out there whose laws, their laws, their customs, their practices are different to everybody else. You can ask another question here. Say, Obviously, they're different. Every nation is different. Every nation's got their own laws. Every nation's got their differences. What? what? But he says they've got they've got different laws. They aren't going to. It's not worthwhile for the king to to, to keep them, and uh, you may as well get rid of them. So it's very interesting. Which verb does he use there when he talks to the king? Which word does he use to, in order to get rid of the to get rid of these people to destroy them? No, it says laabed, laabed, right? If it's good for you, the king, you should write to to uh, have them. The, Right. So how do we, so how do, so how do we how do how do we uh, how do we translate that word? Right. To to to, to lose them, to remove them, to, well, whatever it is. So he says, says the Malbim, what Haman was telling Achashverosh was the following. Right. He says their datim, their their laws, their practices are going to be different from everybody else. So make them change. Meaning he was said it in such a way where it was specifically ambiguous. 
so that he didn't have to think to come along and say, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to destroy all these people. We're going to go in a massacre in your kingdom. That's maybe a little bit of a harder, of, of a harder thing to say. But if you come along and say, we're going to assimilate them. We're going to decree, decree upon them to stop la'abda, meaning to, to, to lose their, their religion, to lose their laws, to lose their, that, 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 that's what he suggested. In fact, Rashi tells us, the Pasuk, towards the end of the Megillah, where it says, la'yudim ayta rav simcha v'sason b'ika. So the Gemara in Megillah says, right, simcha zo, eh, ora zo Torah, simcha is yom tov, right, yakar is tefillin, sason is brit milah. Rashi over there in the Gemara says, because Haman decreed that they couldn't do all of those things. Where does it say that? Where do we find in the Megillah that Haman decreed that uh, you stop learning Torah? We know that was part of the Hanukkah story, right? Where was the part of the part of the Purim story? So he says, maybe, yeah, that, that, that's an allusion to, to, to this idea that a Haman came to Hashverosh and he said, I'm telling you, we have to, not necessarily we have to wipe them out, but he's presenting it in such a way that we have to stop all their laws, we have to stop their practices, we have to assimilate them. And that is what Lab done. Once he gets permission, once a man gets permission from Hashverosh, he can say what he wants. So he writes in the decree, La Rog, La Shmid, La Bed. Wipe them out totally, physically, spiritually, everything. And then now comes comes along, right? Esther comes and says to Achashverosh, "There's somebody. There's this decree. They want to kill. They want to kill us all, right? La rog la shmit la bed. What are you talking about? I never gave permission for that. Gave permission la bed. But uh, Haman, you, you you're trying to pull a fast one. And then we know the end of the story. That's uh, that, that, that's what happens to Haman and what happened to Achashverosh. So that is just another way of of, of understanding." Maybe a very strange uh, conversation that takes place, and uh, adding another level of meaning.